is the forest. It's a product of uh, research I've been doing here as part of the Young Curator Program at the CCA. Uh, and it's also based on the previous research that I've been doing before coming here uh, in North America, mostly the United States, related to the uh, question of how design and forestry are interlinked. Uh, through that, I did some theoretical research, but also some field research um, in, the north, in the Pacific side of, of the United States. Uh, and basically the assumption that led me to apply to this program was uh, the idea that forestry practices are a form of design and certain design moments perhaps are uh, or could be understood through uh, forestry. So this was a very simple and very banal uh, assumption perhaps, but then it led me to uh, look at certain design moments uh, and sort of reframe that. So this was the, the main intuition for applying here, and once I applied here, uh, I benefited from uh, spending some time in the collections and expanding this research to include other histories, other moments, other projects, uh, and also by navigating through this uh, huge collection that is down here, um, it sort of you know clarified uh, the initial idea, and in parallel to that process, we also worked uh, with the people at the CCA to sort of devise uh, the curatorial ID. So how a research, or the main challenge was how a research, uh, which was perhaps more academic or more personal, could be translated into an exhibition. We essentially developed uh, a couple of principles, uh, again, in order to translate that into a curatorial sequence that could communicate to the public through an exhibition uh, format. And probably the first one was the idea that we're dealing with forestry and not forests. And this sounds like a very simple distinction, but to us it was actually very important because it meant that we're not only we're not looking at forests as natural environments, but we, we are rather thinking of them as completely artificial ones. And it also meant that we're looking at forestry as it developed as a form of knowledge, which means we also could bracket uh, the time frame we're looking at. So it starts at a certain moment and it ends, or it doesn't end, but it continues more or less until today. So this was the first thing. Second thing was uh, a sort of contemporary approach to historical materials. So the idea was not to create a historical exhibition that would lead you through the history of forestry, but rather to uh, you know, reframe both contemporary projects and historical materials uh, as a way you know, to put them together and make them reflect on one another, and by that addressing contemporary issues. And I would say the last uh, distinction or sort of guiding principle that we defined was to also consider projects that are not, you know, high architecture necessarily. So we looked at popular architecture at expos uh, and these kind of uh, architectural moments, and I will show some of them later perhaps, that really uh, expand the boundary of what we think of uh, architecture and, and again an architectural exhibition in a place like uh, the CCA. So basically this was translated into this space here which was uh, basically us applying these principles in order to create uh, several groups of materials. And each group that can be seen here, we have four of these groups. Each one is a mix between contemporary uh, projects and historical materials again. Each one deals with a certain moment in the development of the knowledge of forestry and how it reflects on design. Each one deals with a certain geography as well. Each group of material, um, we assigned for it uh, a certain representation, typical representation, which is what you can see on the back wall. Uh, and the idea was that he, each you know, form of forestry has its own logic, and because of that has its own typology of representation. Uh, and the first one we're, we're dealing with is the, really the earliest moment in which forest management emerged, uh, which is around the 16th century in Venice. And we call this uh, group of materials bureaucratic forestry. So we could see that the typology of the representation is the list. Uh, the idea that real territory could be translated into an abstract list in order to control and manage it. What we're dealing with here is basically the Venetian Republic, and the Venetian Republic is highly dependent on its wood supply. So at a certain moment, they realize they should translate uh, nature into resource uh, just in order to sustain their economic mercantile power, more than military power, mercantile power. So they need to build a lot of ships. They do it in the Arsenale, in the, it's a big factory in the, in the Venetian Lagoon. 
Uh, and in order to do that, they need a lot of wood. If you know 16th century shipbuilding, you know how much uh, trees you need in order to build just one ship. So basically, they develop pretty early on, which is something we can see here, they develop this relationship between where the forests are and how they could get to the lagoon. So in this very early sketch, we can see the forest of San Marco, which is in the Veneto region, and the waterways that could connect it or could connect the, the product in a way to the lagoon, which is somewhere down here. And as you know, things developed, um, they are also uh, developing the, the charting and mapping techniques in order to make better and better uh, registers of what they have, what are the resources that they have. While this looks like a you know very perhaps you know descriptive map of the real territory, it actually shows uh, on top of, of the standard representation, what belongs to who, uh, who's where, what is the size of, of uh, certain forests. So this is really an ownership map, as much as it is a, a description of a real place. And these kind of mapping techniques are developing into more and more abstract maps as we go along through the history of the Venetian Republic. And here we see something that is already uh, completely different and kind of striking documents that are really uh, you know, taking into account different levels of information. So it's no longer about the real territory, it's really about how much time it would take a tree to grow. So you see the different months and the moon. Uh, when, when could you cut that? And what are the sizes of the trees that you need in order to, uh, you know, get the mature trees for the ships? To this very, I think, striking list that shows you on the one side uh, a list of forest tracks or forest pieces that could be cut, and on this side, when they could be cut. So it's a sort of chronology uh, of cutting over time as well. And to this last one, which is a completely abstract, slightly later representation, this is already uh, beginning of 18th century, and then we can see forest pieces you know, floating over white space. And then, in this case, we chose to sort of reflect on that through a contemporary a uh, photograph by Guido Guidi, uh, which basically looks at the region that used to belong to the Venetian Republic. And the idea here was to, to sort of pose the argument that this very, you know, articulate uh, bureaucracy allowed for uh, this forest to survive up to this day, which is the case in ne next to Lombardia. This is not Lombardia, but next to Lombardia, and create this thing, which is sort of cultural landscape of this region. But it's not a natural landscape. It was sustained by, you know, the bureaucratic machine. This group of materials uh, is called scientific forestry, and we are now in more or less the 18th century in places in nation states like France, Germany, or Switzerland. And this is really the idea that forests could be managed under scientific principles. And that's why the graphic that represents this group is a forest model. It's this idea that uh, forest systems could be modeled as an ideal system and. Uh, their sort of data could be projected in order to produce uh, the best growing forest. So this idea really begins with the Enlightenment, right? So we chose to open that um, by showing two images that were produced at the same time, in the same place, in France. On the one hand, we have a very strange collage showing all of the type of trees that could be planted. Uh, in gardens on one tree, so it's a collage with all the different leaves of the different trees, you know, treating uh, trees and groups of trees by purely aesthetic terms. On the other hand, we have already Enlightenment thinkers like Duhamel de Monceau, who was, a, was an early, uh, early thinker of forestry, also of naval engineering, already producing these, you know, highly articulate taxonomic uh, systems for all of the parts of the trees, uh, which of course leads him later to developing these treatises that we can see here. Duhamel de Monceau is also a very uh, interesting figure in, in Enlightenment thinking. Uh, but what he's doing here is producing just serially a, a you know, big number of, of these you know, almost manuals for forestry in which he takes the, the scientific information of individual trees and integrate them into systems. So it's already about how to plant uh, scientifically. It's about the anatomy of the tree, its structure. It's about uh, you know, developing the, the whole system that could be sustained over the long term. This is happening in France, but here we're looking at a, at a Swiss version of that. And what is interesting is that while the French version was more or less 
uh, generic in a sense, or at least they try to be as as generic as possible, or as rational and and you know general as possible. The Swiss version, which develops around the 19th century, is already a localized version of the French uh, forestry system. This is the 19th century treatise. Uh, about alpine forestry, what develops as alpine forestry, and it's already localized in the sense that it applies the same rational principles, even pushes the rationality of them further, but it already treats the very specific landscape features of a place like the alpine uh, region. So it deals with, you know, slides, how to, uh, how to deal the top with the topography, how to create a system that it makes sense uh, with the very specific conditions there. And to us, looking at things like that, which is already, in a way, a form of propaganda, um, also Swiss propaganda, but already from the 1960s, in a way it makes sense that this thing, this type of knowledge, translates into how would one represent a Swiss forest to the public, as we can see here, is a hyper, hyper rationalized uh, system that is at the same time very uh, specific to the territory they're dealing with, and with a sort of smooth transition uh, into a contemporary project by Hertz of the Moron that in a way, I wouldn't say apply, but in a way embedded some, some of these principles by arguing that um, forest and settlements could be planned under the same organizational principles. So what we have here is their uh, proposal for the Hanover Grounds, this is from 1992, and what they're trying to suggest here, that this completely artificial system, planting and settlement, could be understood as one uh, integral system of you know, city slash forest. And here you can see how they translate that into a very interesting planning concept in which the models of the forest and the model of the buildings are basically the same. So in order to enhance the curator voice in this exhibition, we also created uh, an, an additional sound layer through which the visitors to the exhibition could experience each group of the materials. And we developed the strategy for that with the experimental uh, sound group from Montreal, uh, Audiotopie. And the idea was, again, to create a specific sound landscape for each group that, in a way, relates both to the content of individual materials, but both to the concept of the whole group. So this group of materials is really uh, already the 20th century in uh, the United States and North America in general. And this is based on the idea that uh, you know, applying some of the principles from the previous groups in a way. We're now facing with big territory uh, and forestry is now understood as a, as a form of economy or at least it is understood through economic terms. So what you have as a graphic to represent that is the business plan. And the, this specific business plan is, uh, is done by a forestry corporation and it's kind of interesting because it shows that land could be uh, converted into timber, could be converted into logs, could be converted into chips, as long as you have sales at the end of it. Uh, and to us, this idea is a very fundamental one for uh, the North American brand of forestry. And it starts, at least in the United States, with a very, uh, almost like a romantic idea of what forestry could be. So this is an image, actually from Europe, from a Swiss forest, the Silwald, taken by the first professional uh, forester in America, and showing, basically used to show how uh, American forestry should look like. You know, with these guys working here, very organized system, uh, very small scale in a way. But once you got to the to the scale of the United States, of course, these things uh, acquire a different specificity, and you have in a couple of years. Uh, huge facilities that are streamlining these operations and they become from something very, um, you know, personal perhaps into a huge machine that is capitalizing on the landscape here. So we see forest, then we see production facility, then we see the shipping out. So it's this sort of streamlined machine that is taking this and translating that into products and into new markets. And new markets, uh, of course, are a very important uh, idea with, with industry and they also lead to the creation of you know, things that are coming out of the forest in a way through uh, the mediation of industry. And you have all sorts of things that acquire certain visibility. So you have you know, the logs on the rivers, you have the huge logs on trucks on the highways, and you also have different uh, type of you know, materials coming out. 
these are actually mat contemporary materials that are still coming out because scientific research uh, is pretty much aligned with industry, right? So you develop new materials that could replace plastic one day, it could replace uh, the way we, uh, the materials we use in cars, etc., etc. And the other side of this visibility is the more propaganda side that we were interested in. Uh, and basically what is interesting here is that at certain moments, the, the logic that operates uh, in the forestry industry is translated into architectural projects such as this one. And again, this relates to uh, our idea of not having only history of high architecture, but also looking at things like that. So this is a Barney McLeod uh, pavilion for the British Columbia province in Osaka, the Osaka Expo in 1970. And it, takes the models that are being used in the forestry industry in order to create this building. So this is not a romantic idea of the forest. He's not representing trees or his you know, feelings or anything like that. It's really uh, a very smart, I think, translation of what the industry is at that moment into a sort of architectural statement. And this is happening again here in a different way. This is taken from the expo here in Montreal in 67. And on a slightly different version of propaganda, you have this urban image in which um, you know, the largest tree of the industry, the Douglas Sphere, is being collaged on a cityscape in order to demonstrate its scale uh, and talk about, of course, the scale of the industry as well. Conservation has a very rich history in the 19th century uh, with a lot of sort of cultural influence and a very strong movement. So, in a way, all of the plans that we show here for forest plans, American forest plans, had to mediate between these two positions. Because even if you're working from within the industry, you always had this notion of conservation, either as a resistance or embedded in what you're doing. So this one is the first uh, forest plan in the United States, uh, done by Gifford Pinchot, who was, again, the first American forester uh, to work in the United States. And what is interesting here is that he's working under uh, Frederick Law Olmsted at the Biltmore Estate, uh, which is part of the Vanderbilt Estate, which is kind of an interesting uh, story of itself. But what is interesting here is that he already embeds two things here. One is a sort of correspondence with the territory and correspondence with a long-term uh, management of this part of the world that could be sustained uh, as, a, as a landscape, so in a way conservation. but. He's already dealing with you know, how to divide this uh, into certain blocks that could be cut over the long term. And this is the first experiment in the United States to demonstrate that forest could be something that could produce revenue over the long term. And here we have you know, a different attempt of integration of these two uh, tendencies in a new deal experiment to create a living or, or a sort of total system of industry, forest, uh, and community. You know, this idea that such a cycle of production could be sustained for 100 years, as they call it. And on this one here, we have uh, one of the moments in which these attempts of integration failed. And this is a forestry pattern uh, that exists in, in certain places in, in the Pacific Northwest. This one specifically is in Montana, and it shows this, what they call the checkerboard pattern, in which, you know, the, the what, where it's clear-cut, it's basically owned by uh, private forestry corporations. Where it's not clear-cut, it's owned by the government. And apart from the fact that this has a very specific history that led to this pattern, um, this pattern also leads to uh, an ecological disaster uh, and also to uh, you know, very hard management uh, situation in which you have to run double infrastructures because it's owned by uh, different corporations or organizations. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in a way, this failed integration also became a pattern of uh, ecological and infrastructural problems. And the project that we chose here in order to reflect on this American tradition is the Warehouser uh, Headquarters building, designed by SOM San Francisco in the, 19, the late 1960s. It was open around 1970. And what is interesting here is that they really captured the moment in which the industry was uh, through architecture. So what they do is they really, uh, it is positioned in the forest, they really use the, the rationale of forestry to challenge some of the conceptions of this kind of typology. So we can see here, for instance, that they produce a very interesting system between the outside forest that is you know, cut in a very specific way on the outside, um, this receding 
uh, curtain wall that goes a little bit inside and create this very strange um, sort of spectrum of sort of transition be between a sort of natural system and an artificial system of vegetation inside. And this is also seen in this section here, produced by SLM, in which trees are planted here, building is here, you know, terraced vegetation, forest at the background. It's not really clear what is artificial and what is natural anymore, as we can see also in this image from Architectural Forum. And again, I think what is interesting in this, uh, this their annual report from 1971, we can see again the business diagram next to the image of the executive sitting in the building, overlooking the forest, and again, nature, artificial environments, business diagrams are all part of the same uh, rationale at this moment. So we're now in, in colonial India around the 19th century, uh, and this group of materials we call tropical forestry. And this really deals with the idea of what is happening to uh, forestry as it was formed in Europe once it encounters uh, tropical contexts which are very different both in scale and in the conditions uh, through which the forest is being formed. So the type of document we are uh, choosing to, to represent this group of materials is the sample because samples were being used as carrier of information between the colonies and the colonial ruler. So hundreds and thousands of these uh, wood samples were being sent back and forth between London and places like Burma, uh, you know, Calcutta, other, other areas of colonial India in order to uh, construct an image of what the empire has and how it could be exploited. So this history really begins uh, with rude, sort of rough exploitation. The first encounters of the colonial powers with a uh, place like India uh, was always uh, related to destruction. So this uh, image here is one example from the CCA collection here showing what this, this destruction uh, looked like. But I think pretty quickly they realized that they have to uh, devise management systems in order to um, you know, not only control the territory, but also uh, exploit it in an economical way. Because the British Empire was really uh, always about trying to uh, not only exploit whatever you had, but also think of a long-term strategy in order to benefit from that economically. So pretty quickly they develop very interesting surveys like this one, and pretty quickly they turn into uh, forestry plants. And this specific forest plant which we uh, found, this specific one is in Burma, is a rather interesting one because it's not only a forest plant over a very large territory, it's also one of the earliest plants that I know for regional planning because this is 1870 and this is 30 or 40 years because before planning as a discipline evolves in the United States. And then when we think about how this uh, exploitation uh, you know, happened, it was basically a very labor-intensive process in which trees, in this case again, thick trees in Burma, very valuable resource, had to be cut down, had to be uh, somehow organized on the ground, and had to be shipped through very, very labor-intensive uh, infrastructure building. So this sort of magnitude and scale of the territory also entailed the creation of infrastructure. And once infrastructure was in place, the creation of new markets was enabled. So then what we see uh, around the end of the, 18th, in the 19th century, we see things like that. Workers in Rangoon uh, using traditional systems of uh, artisan, art, artisanal knowledge in order to produce these very articulate uh, works of art now being uh, integrated into trade catalogs and being sold to new markets in the United States. So then as a result of that, we see these kind of interiors beginning to uh, appear in places in the Midwest as a sort of sign of power of the Gilded Age uh, era. And then in a way, we're trying to uh, suggest here that some of these things perhaps could be reflected upon by contemporary uh, design projects. In this case, that's the uh, Studio Mumbai project for the Venice Biennale, which is a very nice and interesting project by itself, but what we were interested in uh, was how they describe it through, again, labor-intensive practices, local knowledge, and what they call human infrastructure. And again, while this project is a very uh, pleasing one in a sense, because you like to like it, we also like to pose the question whether, in a way, it's not a new form of the same thing that was happening a hundred years ago in which one thing was produced in this side of the world 
and present it to the West as a nice uh, contemporary design statement. So this part is a small afterwards of what we've seen in the, in the gallery, uh, inside of the gallery. And the idea here is really to reflect on uh, certain things that are happening today in the woods. Uh, so what is happening now in forestry. Um, and by that we're suggesting also, of course, to reflect on contemporary design. But perhaps uh, this could be concluded by saying that the hypothesis of this exhibition is essentially very simple. It's trying to argue that if forestry could be understood as design, perhaps certain design and architecture moments could be understood through the lens of forestry. Now, you're not necessarily have to accept this hypothesis, but I hope it could uh, at least, you know, uh, challenge some of our preconceptions of, of what the boundaries of architecture is.